Sir Pramir Ravi is joining in. And good evening to the rest of us. Um, just really excited today because I will be discussing, um, hopefully, obviously an amazing case with Ravi today. The, the jitters and the nerves are kicking in, uh, but um, I'm excited. So let's yeah. start. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. I feel you. Hopefully that'll fade away by the end of this conversation and then uh, be minimally the next time. But we're, we're delighted. We actually have a friend and colleague uh, from Ravi's program in Sinai, Shashrita, who's joining us today. Do you want to say a quick hello and then we'll jump right into the case? Hey, um, uh, I'm sorry, Danya, correct? I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Nice to meet you. So um, I, I hope this case is exciting for everyone. We were very excited to discuss it. Um, so um, this is a case of someone presenting with a unilateral blurriness of vision. Um, so this was a 73-year-old male who came in with one day history of sudden onset blurriness of vision in his right eye, um, which prompted him to have an outpatient visit with his ophthalmologist. Ooh, what an intriguing start. Wow, I guess to do some opto today. Yeah. So Danya, what are your what are your initial thoughts? Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so the first thing that comes to my mind, especially looking at the um, age of the patient and sudden onset, I would really like to rule out. Uh, first of all, I would like to know the duration as to when did the patient experience this particular complaint? What um, how, was it associated with any other findings? Uh, some, some, what I really mean by that is sensory uh, neurological issues. And did it resolve after some time? So in order to rule out any transient ischemic attack versus any uh, ischemic uh, issue. Um, and then also, um, yeah, that would be my first, um, the first thought that comes to my mind. Yeah. You know, Dania, I think in that reflex response that you just shared is a lot of learning. And honestly, I think that this space is, is very difficult because it, it sh goes to show you that if you don't know what the problem is, you can easily go astray. And the reason it's hard to know what the problem is, is actually twofold. So I won't teach anything new, but elaborate on the challenges that you will have if you're taking care of this patient, even before they go to ophthalmology, which is one. Whenever somebody has a complaint in the eye, you don't know if it's ocular or neurologic, and you have to do some things to be um, confident about whether you need ophthalmology or neurology. That's always the tension. And the other tension is that the nature of the visual complaint can be a little bit elusive. Some patients, when they say blurry, they mean visual loss. Some patients, when they say blurry, they just mean that they can see okay, but there's almost like there's oil in the way. And when some patients mean blurry, they actually mean double vision. And that's what makes it blurry. And double vision is an entirely different complaint. So here, here are the following traps in this case. We don't know if it's blurry or not, or if it's visual loss or if it's double vision, because those words can be confusing. We also don't know if it's neurologic or ophthalmologic from the get-go, because when the patient says it's their right eye, it could be their right eye which is ophthalmologic, but it could also be the right visual field, which is neurologic. So here, you really, really have to make sure that you don't commit to the following problem representation. A 73-year-old man with sudden onset blurry vision in the right eye. My working problem representation would be an older man with an acute onset visual complaint on the right side. And then I would try to uh, work on what the visual complaint is with the exam and then work on if is it right eye or right visual field. The fact that we know the patient was seen by ophthalmology and sent to the ER should not make you think that this is an optical problem. It's not uncommon that ophthalmolo ophthalmology says, wait, nope, our exam is normal. You should call neuro neurology for this issue, which happens to me quite frequently. Um, so in what, going back to what you said, I think your reflex was to ask more questions. And I think that's the right move. And hopefully now we're all clear on the reasons. We don't know if it's eye or brain, and we don't know if it's loss, blurry, or double. All righty, back to you guys. 
All right. Um, yeah, excellent question. So this was the 73 year old gentleman. He had one day history of the sudden onset blurriness of vision in his right eye, which then prompted him to visit his outpatient ophthalmologist. Um, when he visited his outpatient ophthalmologist, they noted bilateral optic disc edema, um, following which he was sent to the ED. Um, he does have past medical history of HIV, CKD stage two, um, bradycardia for which he got a pacemaker, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and hep C, which was previously treated. Um, as far as his medications are concerned, he is on amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, Bictarvi, rosuvastatin, aspirin, tamsulosin, and vitamin D. Um, as far as family history goes, um, he just had concerns of maternal history of dementia. And for social history, he lives at home um, with a partner who he is sexually active with, and it's a male sexual partner. And he does consume alcohol, but it's rarely. He's a former smoker, but denies any other substance abuse. Um, I can see why you're a chief resident or incoming chief resident. Just the flow and the focus of your presentation is amazing. Thank you so much. I feel like I'm on RLR with Reza presenting to me, quite honestly. Um, Danya, where'd your mind yeah. go with this information? Oh, it's just, um, honestly, I, I don't know if I can really, you know, my brain can point to something, but I do know that um, if a patient is presenting with bilateral optic disc edema, we should rule out any inflammatory causes for it. Maybe it can be ongoing infections that we need to look into. Um, I don't know if given the history of the patient, I don't think any drugs that are mentioned over here, I'm not sure if they do cause optic disc edema. Honestly, that's the, the only two things that came to my mind. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, I'll again, I think you just have to be earnest with why you're, you're saying, oh, those are the only two things that come to my mind. And I think what is happening is you are illustrating a very key principle of thinking, which is the real problem hasn't emerged yet for you to generate a longer differential diagnosis. And instead of being um, shy about the fact that not many thoughts are coming in, I think that you should sit with that and recognize that that's actually really important. Because we, and you're, and, and to prove that point, watch how it was so easy in the first aliquot to be like, hey, this is just a right eye problem. And watch how your questions have resulted in more data that has allowed us to actually say, no, this is not a right eye problem. This is a bilateral optic nerve problem. And here you are now asking more questions and needing more information because you didn't make the mistake of saying that this optic nerve problem is already defined. It's not. It's not. You raise the possibility of optic neuritis or inflammation of the optic nerve causing edema. Can you think of other categories or other labels that you might put on? Like, can you think of other ways the optic nerve can be diseased in addition to inflammation? What else can happen to the optic nerve in general? Just uh, ischemia mm -hmm. uh, can cause optic 100%. neuritis as well. 100%. And can you think of another label except optic neuritis? So optic something like any other non, uh, any other label that you can think about? And I'll give you a hint. What if this patient had a headache, nausea, vomiting, and then these, yeah. what would increase you think? Increasing trochlear pressure, papilledema cause, because of increasing trochlear pressure, or maybe idiopathic intracranial hypertension. But given the, given the, I don't know if, I'm not sure if it is this common in yeah. males and that an elderly age group. 100%. I think that's more common in women. Yep. So I think what, here's what we know. We know that the optic nerves are swollen. And there's a first key question. Is it swollen because there's inflammation causing reactive edema? Anywhere there's inflammation, there's edema. Anywhere, right? Or is it edematous because of hydrostatic pressure forces, right? So is it inflamed or uh, is it edematous because of hydrostatic forces? That's the first branch point. The second branch point within inflammation is, is it infectious or non-infectious? So you have a schema that the first branch point is, is it inflamed or hydrostatic? Under inflamed, is it infectious or non-infectious? 
And under hydrostatic, is it local edema or is it reflection of intracranial hypertension or CSF or, or brain problems? To give you an example of a very common cause of local edema is malignant hypertension. So the vessels get engorged and they leak fluid. To give you an example of intracranial hypertension is any cause of ICP. So the question is, can we prioritize inflammation versus hydrostatic edema? And I think the only reason to prioritize um, uh, inflammation is the patient's history of HIV. That should prompt us to lean towards thinking of infections and malignancies potentially related to HIV. And the fact that um, there is no evidence of CNS manifestations rules out the CNS portion of edema, but does not uh, make the patient immune to local forces of edema, such as malignant hypertension, which we'll have to wait to see. So I think that's where my head is at is, is it inflamed or not? If it is inflamed, is it an infection or not? If it's not inflamed, I don't think it's a brain problem, but could it be local hydrostatic forces from the blood pressure? Alrighty, tell us more. Um, all really excellent points. Um, so physical exam for this patient, temperature was 37.2, heart rate of 85 beats per minute, respiratory rate was normal at 20, and blood pressure was also 133 over 69. Um, exam wise, general, no acute distress. The predominant finding was um, in the HENT, where his right eye um, was had a sluggishly reactive pupil with loss of central vision in terms of his visual field. Um, as far as the left eye goes, there was intact left eye vision. And um, again, there was no congestion, um, no other findings um, around the orbit. Um, respiratory exam was normal, bilateral period auscultation um, and cardiovascular was normal as well. No tachycardia, no murmurs, extremities, no deformities, no swellings, no edema. Neurologically, he was alert and oriented times four um, with no, no other focal neurological findings on exam. Um, as far as labs were concerned for him, um, the interesting things were that his CMP and CBC were completely within normal range, um, but his SED rate was elevated at 50 and his CRP was elevated as well at 49. Oh, so intriguing. Thank you. All right, Danya, you got a little bit more. Um, what, did, what of all this data... What did your mind uh, latch on to first? What do you think is the most interesting thing diagnostically? The fact that there is um, loss of uh, pupil reactivity and central vision. <clears throat> Obviously, that's the one thing that really uh, hit uh, me over here. Um, and that of uh, looking, uh, looking at this particular complaint, I'm still thinking, given the inflammatory markers that are raised, it can be... Um, giant cell arteritis that can cause optic neuritis and uh, sudden loss of vision. Um, again, why is there loss of central vision and not peripheral vision as well? Not sure of that. Um, the second thing that I would still try, like to rule out is um, any infectious etiology. Um, yeah, so those are the two things that I would like to rule out. and. Uh, Given the blood pressure, um, obviously, uh, this cannot be malignant hypertension since the patient is normal tensive at this point. What else would you like to add? <laughs> no, I think, you know, if we start with that initial schema of saying, is it edema or not, the blood pressure is normal and there's no intracranial symptoms. So, and then you look at the labs, you see the patient's inflamed. So you're like, this is, this, we should call this operic neuritis until proven otherwise. And then the question is, well, what is the clue with the, the fact that the pupil is uh, sluggishly reactive? And it might be suggesting that the patient has an afferent pupillary defect, which basically confirms the idea that you're dealing with an optic nerve issue, right? That's all it really says. Um, something that would be really, really cool to do, which uh, I don't know if I would have done in real time, which I think is would be very suggestive of the, of the working diagnosis that I haven't shared yet, but I think is the case, is if the uh, pupil reacted well to accommodation. So I'll let you think about that, is if the pupil is... Uh, what 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 does it mean if the pupil is sluggishly reactive to light, but reacts very well and constricts in a, to accommodation? Uh, that might clue you in further to the to the working diagnosis. 
Um, and I think just Steve just said it. Her grammar reaction. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, you're, 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 you're thinking. I don't know if I'm just I thought. No, no, no. Really you steered the pronunciation. No, you said the diagnosis right. Uh, although Jerish Hirschheimer re refers to when patients get sick after treatment for syphilis, what you might be thinking of is the Argyle Robinson right. pupil. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it is when the pupil reacts to accommodation. But so, what's the learning here? The learning is the following: you got to stick to the original schema. And now you're, uh, this is optic neuritis. So let me share um, a simple way of thinking about optic neuritis, which is if, at first you have to think infection or autoimmune. The autoimmune categories, you have to be careful because your reflex will be MS and uh, demyelinating diseases, but you have to rule out vasculitis to the optic nerve in the form of GCA. That's the rule out. What makes that a little bit less likely is the lack of other GCA symptoms that we've received and the simultaneous bilateral onset of the disease. Usually GCA will affect one optic nerve and then affect the other in a sequential manner. But the morbidity of GCA does not allow us to rule it out on those grounds alone. So the question is, what are the infectious causes of optic neuritis? And the answer is syphilis and cats. Syphilis and cats. Now cats can actually cause three different infections that result in optic neuritis. Bartonella, Bartonella hensley, very important cause of neuroretinitis, as is toxoplasmosis in HIV patients, and its parasitic cousin, Toxacara. So three bugs from cats. What's the biggest clue for syphilis in this patient? There are two of them. One, the patient has HIV and sexually transmitted infections travel together. And two, two, syphilis is the only infectious cause of optic neuritis that spares the retina. Most other causes of infection of the optic nerve cause a neuroretinitis, Bartonella, toxoplasmosis, toxicara. The, the, the normal ophthalmologic exam for the retina, along with this patient with HIV from aliquot to optic neuritis, HIV is syphilis until proven otherwise. Now, why do I say that? Because you can actually do a combination right there to even further increase your suspicion of syphilis. And three, if you don't send the RPR on this patient, you're going to go down a massive rabbit hole of unnecessary workup. So um, it's really hard to suspect that in real life. I've seen many patients get MRIs and biopsies and, and uh, GCA empiric treatment when they have uh, optic neuritis. By seen, I mean I've seen one or two cases, um, but mostly read about it prompted by those cases. So optic nerve, inflammation, or edema. This is an inflamed optic nerve. When you think optic neuritis, First, rule out infection, then move on to MS and GCA. What infections? Syphilis and cats. Why syphilis a priority? Because they're sparing of the retina. So I think um, that would be the arc that I would map out for this patient. Uh, any any questions or thoughts about that, Danya? Any clarifying points? Or yeah, where's your head at otherwise? Yeah, just thinking of whether um, CMV... Um retinitis, I mean, I know that it has intracranial manifestations, but are there yeah. any situations where it yeah. may not cause those and also just cause um, loss of uh, vision? Yeah, Danya, you should hold on to what you just said. So what was the word that you said after CMV? Think about that for a second. Retinitis. Right, exactly. So the retina is the hot spot for activity for all these infections. So if this case were different and the ophthalmologist sent this patient not for optic nerve edema, but rather for retinal inflammation, oh my God, CMV would probably be number one, two, three, four, and five. But the lack of retinal involvement is an incredibly powerful clue to the nature of the infections here. And Vali is bringing up a great point. I see that in the chat about TB. And that's the other crazy thing about TB is it actually involves all the layers of the eye, the uvea, the choroid, the retina, and the optic nerve. And the fact that this patient has such restricted involvement makes me say words you should never say, which makes me think TB is less likely. And every time I've said that, I've come to regret it. But I think Factually speaking, you should probably put TB on the list, but lower it because it's so restricted in its involvement. 
All righty. Tell us more, please. There we go. Um, so that was a really great discussion, actually, all really important points. Um, but the other studies that we did, we did get an LP for the patient. Um, so the opening pressure was 11 centimeters of water. Um, it was clear appearing fluid analysis just showed six WBCs with the lymphocyte predominance and a mildly elevated protein and a negative PCR viral panel. Um, they, we also did rheumatological workup, uh, but all of that panned out negative with the negative ANA, CNCA, PNCA, NTSSA, and NTSSB. Um, the patient did also get a temporal artery biopsy um, because um, I think the differentials we were discussing were in the lead, like GCA, but that was negative for any arteritis. Um, and we also got imaging uh, with an MRI brain, which showed asymmetrical focal T2 hyper intense signal within the distal right intra-articular optic nerve, which represented inflammation. Um, and we also got an optic coherence tomography, which showed um, a finding, which I'll discuss after my RPR results, uh, which was basically syphilis EIA and RPR titer was positive, one is to 128. Um, and the optic coherence tomography confirmed that it was active syphilis infiltrating the right eye with uh, chorioretinal lesions. Oh my gosh, that's such, a, I mean, I think that like your case is so um, reflective of the challenges of making this diagnosis. I'm really curious and I'll, I'll pass the mic to Diana to reflect. I'm really curious if you can uh, educate me on what is it about the optic coherence tomography that that made them think it was syphilis? I've never heard this before. Do you know? That's actually a great question. We actually had an off the prelim who was there yeah. during case who mentioned that they can actually specify the type of infiltrating lesions that they see that is more specific oh, for syphilis apparently so that definitely helped is what i understood that's cool that is really cool i did not know that i'll have to do some reading about that thank you um danya what do you think can i just say that first of all this was such an uh, it, this was presented in such a beautiful manner that everything explained the examination right on point i loved hearing the entire case presentation and also very humbled because I learned a lot. Uh, thank you to you and uh, for the case presentation to Shrasi, just, um, sorry, so Shrata. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say, just yeah. really uh, blown, blown away. Yeah, I'm, uh, same. I think that, I think that um, I hope this for you all serves as the prompt um, that a similar case served for me to just optimize the arc for evaluating these patients. I think every test that was obtained here was definitely really important because um, syphilis is so common that you have to really go to a, an additional lens to make sure there's nothing else going on too. And um, I think the interesting thing that I'd love to learn uh, um, from you all, if you were the treatment team of what kind of syphilis you call this, because I think it has tremendous implications for treatment and how this patient is treated. So I'll pass the mic, uh, I'll pass the mic back to you uh, to tell us what happened, what you diagnosed the patient with and, and how, uh, how he was treated, because I think uh, it's an important additional conversation to have. Sure. Um, so we called it ocular syphilis, which is basically a manifestation of neurosyphilis. And we treated it as such um, with IV penicillin for a duration of four, 14 days. Um, but the interesting part, which we did discuss about, is that um, GCA was a very um, leading differential. So, um, you know, Ofto and ID were on board and ID sincerely believed it was syphilis, but Ofto was more concerned that it could still be GCA until we got the biopsy results. So we did have the patient on high dose steroids as well simultaneously, which is why the temporal biopsy results were important to come in a timely manner because it's almost contra, you know, contradicting what we're trying to do. Um, but once it was negative, we just had the patient on um, IV penicillin. Yeah, I think that's, that's so important. You know, like if you get that RPR and it's positive early, like on day one, you, you, you're not done because the rate of completely asymptomatic syphilis pushes you to think, does this person have HIV? Have they had syphilis for some time? And because they're 73, do they have GCA as well? And the rate of response for syphilis is not quick enough for you to be confident. Like you can't just say, okay, I'm going to give this patient penicillin and see them get better. They don't get better that, that quickly. Um, I'd also say that the LP here is very, very classic for neurosyphilis. 
because one thing that you'll you'll be underwhelmed by is patients with syphilis, just like patients with cryptococcus, tend to have very little CSF inflammation, one or two extra white blood cells, a little bit of extra protein. So that's another thing to latch on to. Do you know if the CSF VDRL came back positive or negative? Or um, Interestingly, the VDRL was negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The sensitivity of the VDRL is very low, and I think it goes to show you how diagno how diagnosing syphilis in the in the brain is hard. But the specificity is very high. If it comes back, it's very very helpful. Well, amazing! This is a really really cool case. Thank you so much. What did you? Uh, what was your biggest takeaway from it? Um, so I think um, you know, again, I don't think we deal with um, ocular complaints as often. So it really helped to go down that route, you know, things we learn in med school to really think about it anatomically. And then like this, like we discussed the type of presentation um, and also keeping in mind that syphilis is still an active issue, especially in the HIV population to keep in mind that it has so many differing manifestations. When we think of neurosyphilis, I don't know if we always think ocular manifestations. So I think that was a huge takeaway point as well. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, I hope you'll break rounds every day and come hang out with us at this rate. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Um, all righty. Uh, well, I'll pass the link to Maddie to, to recap this journey for us. All right. What a fantastic half hour. Just really want to echo that this was a fantastic case presentation. Um, and Danya, really inspired by your discussion. So uh, jumping into the teaching points. So we started off with the chief concern of unilateral blurry revision. And we talked about how uh, it can be challenging to approach this immediately because the first challenge is you have to figure out, is this an ocular or a neurologic issue? So ocular being of the eye and neurologic issue, potentially like a visual field deficit. And also um, a visual kind of chief concern can be elusive because when someone says blurry vision, they may mean double vision or vision loss. So you really need to initially just frame this as acute onset visual complaint and then uh, try to make progress on that visual complaint by asking questions like the onset, duration, and associated symptoms. Um, we eventually learned that this was, um, there was swelling of the optic disc. So with optic nerve disease, an, an initial branch point you can use is, is there the presence of inflammation or is there edema due to hydrostatic forces? So if it is due to inflammation, you wanna ask, is it infectious or not? If it's due to hydrostatic forces, you wanna ask, is it local or is it a reflection of increased intracranial pressure? So an example of local is something like malignant hypertension. If, if it's a reflection of increased intracranial pressure, that can just be any cause of ICP. Um, even before we got to the physical exam, we talked about how we could actually prioritize inflammatory causes because of HIV, HIV history and because there's no evidence of CNS manifestations. Um, we also talked about how to approach optic neuritis, which is an inflamed optic nerve, and you can think about infectious or autoimmune causes. Autoimmune causes um, include demyelinating disease like MS, but also GCA, which is a, a do not miss here. This was a little bit, a little bit less likely given the lack of other symptoms. Uh, infectious causes, you want to think syphilis and cats, and there are three bugs that go along with the cats, which is Bartonella henslei, toxoplasmosis, and Toxicara. Before the testing, we actually talked about how you could prioritize syphilis given the history of HIV because sexually transmitted infections travel together, and that uh, syphilis is the only infectious cause of optic neuritis that spares the retina. So the other etiologies cause optic neuritis, but with the normal retina and the presence of HIV, we were prior to prioritizing syphilis. Uh, we talked about how for the eye exam, if it, the pupil's reactive to light, but not accommodation, that would suggest the Argyll-Robertson pupil. Uh, and then we learned um, kind of just some testing, uh, interesting pearls that optic coherence tomography can um, specify the type of the infiltrating lesion, which is how they made progress on syphilis in this case. And ultimately, you know, this was diagnosed with diagnosed as ocular syphilis, a manifestation of neurosyphilis treated with IV penicillin. Um, and then last we learned that uh, VDRL was low and uh, we learned that the sensitivity of that test is low, but the specificity is high. All right, that's it.
<laughs> that's it. That was incredible. <laughs> wow. I, uh, yeah, that's very impressive to capture all that. Uh, we, we certainly babbled away. Danya, thank you so much. That was so cool to discuss with you. And I hope, um, well, actually, before we go, I'm curious, how are the nerves now compared to when you started? Uh, they're, they've calmed down. Good. And also, I'm very excited because uh, the way you led the discussion really helped me to, you know, to teach myself how to think in any future, uh, you know, discussion. Yeah, I 100%. I can't and otherwise, wait that. I can't wait for the next one. And hopefully it will be a ton of fun. Um, all right, y'all. Thank you again. Um, I hope you, uh, sorry, I just, um, I got a little alert on my computer. I hope you, um, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day rounding folks. And hopefully the day isn't too, too busy. And we uh, really, really hope that we'll see you on VMR in the future. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.